All right, I'm Dan Finkelstein, and uh, the first time I went into what evolved to the housing court was the civil courts in New York. I was about 15 or 16 years old. I used to go with my father when he had a, he had a couple of uh, buildings in Harlem, and occasionally he had a dispossessed a tenant, and I would go with him. Uh, then later on, about 1952, I went to work for the city housing authority as a housing assistant. And I had occasion to go as a principal to uh, the civil court and do the non-payment proceedings. And the way we did it then was the housing assistant used to prepare all the papers, do the petition, file it, serve it, and then the corporation counsel would assign an attorney to go to court with you when you had to go to court. So I was familiar with the dispossessed process, if you will. And what in those, was the those, dispossessed process days, like when it was civil court? In those days, the, 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 no decent self-respecting lawyer would handle the case. They didn't like it. They used to send their clients to the marshal. The marshal used to draw the petitions for them, and uh, if they got an answer, when they had to put a lawyer's name on it, they would just stamp a, uh, put a stamp, rubber stamp with a lawyer's name and address on the petition, and the lawyer would get the notice of trial when it came up, and usually the first time a lawyer saw the case was when he answered ready in court. At any rate, uh, I was doing that for the housing authority, then I uh, uh, left that. I went to work as a uh, real estate manager for the Board of Estimate. I was doing relocation work for both the housing authority and the Board of Estimate. But I didn't have occasion to go to court very often on that. I think once I was in court for the, uh, on a course block express where we had a tent that was delinquent. I went to court and the judge looked at this whole crowd of people in front of him he said, who's that? And he pointed to me. The corporation counsel said, that's Mr. Finkelstein. He's a senior real estate manager in charge of the Horse Park Expressway. And the judge said, oh, I thought he was one of the kids. <laughs> thought he was one of the family members of the kids. At any rate, uh, it's, as things evolved, I got engaged. The civil service wasn't giving me enough of a salary to support a wife, so I decided by this time I'd become a lawyer. So I went to, uh, oh, by the way, there's the background. I got my first real estate salesman's license in 1947. I got my broker's license in 1949. I got an insurance broker's license in 1952. So by the time I got my law license in 1956, I kind of knew what the situation was. I couldn't get a job, so it's just like it is now. And by that time, I was in my 30s. So I uh, uh, went to work. I was running for office, too. What I, office did you run for? I was nominated for city council by the Democratic Party twice. I was nominated and ran for state senator once uh, as a Republican three times. Then, then I moved to Putnam County. The Democrats nominated me for town justice of town mm -hmm. Carmel. So I ran three times there. It's uh, so I'm the only one I know that ran for public office yeah. six times, wow. three times as a Republican, three times as a Democrat. Because I've always said I'm a professional. I'm not in this thing as an ideologue. I'm not for landlords. I'm not for tenants. I'm not for, I'm for just do what's sensible and proper. At any rate. Uh, so when you started practicing law, where were you yeah, set I would, up? I, would, I set up, I was a storefront lawyer, 103rd Street and Broadway. Then I had an office at 200, 205 East 145th Street between 7th and 8th Avenues. Now it's a different name, Edward. Edward. I don't know, they got different names for the streets now, <laughs> up at home. They name everything after people now. At any rate, uh, I wasn't doing well as an uh, individual lawyer anyway, and I had to, uh, I, so I took an a, a, a interim appointment again for State Rent Commission. I was uh, Assistant Chief Enforcement Attorney for the State Rent Commission. And then in 1964, in June of 64, two things happened. First, they merged the Division of Housing and the Red State, Temporary State Budgeting Commission into the Division of Housing. Commissioner became a Deputy Commissioner, Council became uh, so the lower, uh, everybody got bumped down. When I was a low man at Totem Bowl, I got bumped out. So I left my job as Assistant Chief Enforcement Attorney and Chief of Library Services of the Temporary State Red Commission. And at that time, there was about two or three lawyers they were doing all the work for the marshals and answering cases in the civil court. One of them, a guy named I. Herman Hirsch, 
was 48 years old and he died unexpectedly. And then Marshall, he worked for Henry Lazarus, was looking for somebody to take his place. I got bumped out of the commission. Somebody had seen me in court once or twice, recommended me to the Marshal, and I became his, the attorney in his back office. So I was down in court from June 1, 1964. I got my practice as a specialist in landlord and tenant law. I started doing chiefly that, and eventually, by 1968, 69, I was doing only that, nothing else. So I was in court every single day, uh, usually with 10 to 15 cases a day on my calendar and handling uh, the commercial and housing. Everything was in one part. Landlord and tenant was broken up into two parts, and, uh, but they were all done, no, it wasn't in two parts, it was one part. There was a regular plenary part of the court and the landlord and tenant part. Trial one was the regular part, trial two was landlord and tenant, mm -hmm. trial three was jury. And then they had a special two also, but that's it. That's the only divisions there were. So you were already there practicing when they started talking about creating this housing court. That's right, that's right. So tell me about that. It, okay. it seemed like it was a war between the tenants, attorneys, the ideologues, and me. They kept do, doing all kinds of things to make the system more complicated to, because uh, really it was very simple. The marshal did the papers, he came to court, the judge would have a conference and he'd say to the tenant, what's the problem? And if a tenant complained about repairs, he'd say, well, you have to go to the building department for that. Of course, I can't help you with that. But uh, how about uh, if I get you more time? Would it be all right? You need more time? Yes, okay. Well, if 10 days all right? Yes, Judge, 10 days would be fine. So, okay, fine, Judge, and landlord, 10 days, Mr. Finkel said, course waived, attorney's fees waived. Yes, Judge, okay, bang. That way it's very easy to handle cases. Uh, that's why I could handle 15 cases a day. When it came to holdovers, it's more complicated. Holdovers, uh, somebody's got to move out. The judge would say to the tenant, how much time do you need to move? The tenant would say, 30 days, Judge, or 60 days. So the judge would say, final judgment, 30 days stay, or 60 days stay. Is that all right, Mr. Finney? Yes, Judge, that's okay. All right, next case. And then that's it, the case has moved on. Once in a while, I had an adjournment. But then when the legal aid and the other 10 lawyers got involved and they want to make a crusade out of it, they, they would uh, lobby for special legislation. They were saying that nothing was working right. They had to improve everything. Well, okay, didn't bother me. It felt like they were at war with me, especially when uh, the statute used to provide that a proceeding might be brought by uh, the landlord's attorney, his agent, or uh, assignee of rents. And they had the, the law modified because they didn't like the fact that I was bringing all these actions myself. Instead of my lady marshal uh, stamp the papers, I said, I don't need that, I'll do it myself. And I didn't have a, a, a pad of blank papers signed in advance by a landlord filled in by a marshal. I prepared the petitions when the case came in, reviewed them, and verified them, and I brought them myself. So they wanted to eliminate that. So, so where did this idea of the housing court come well, from? Well, wait, 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 wait. I'll get to it. All right. It's called, we'll get some long anyway. Okay. Now, they thought they were warring with me, and I laughed at it. I didn't care about the war because the more they warred, the more they did, the more complicated the system became, the more they had to do, the more money I made, the more they needed me, the more they needed lawyers. It got to the point where eventually uh, they weren't happy with the fact that I would adjourn the case once while I told my client to make the repairs that the tenant was asking for, and they come back, the repairs are done, I get my final judgment be all over. That's no good. They had enforcement proceedings. They didn't like the fact that they had to go to, to the criminal court and prosecute landlords that wouldn't make repairs. So they came up with the idea of having this, this uh, code enforcement handled civilly in the same court that's handling non payment cases. Well, the statute provides if a landlord wants to collect his rent, he brings his action in a civil court. Now you're going to bring it to the house, now they split it in two parts, the housing part and the non-housing part. So they get, now you get a whole crew of people, the housing court judges, who come in and you think that they're coming into a court designed for the purpose of collecting rents. They didn't think so. They thought they were coming into a court that's designed to enforce the housing code. 
to make sure tenants get their, their uh, just desserts and, and to take care of. So I remember having a conversation with one judge. I said, Judge, I know you don't like to evict tenants, and you say you're not evicting a tenant, but what are you going to do if a tenant comes to you and says, I can't pay the rent? Nothing wrong with my apartment. I just don't have the money. I can't pay the rent. What are you going to do? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to sign an eviction order. I said, what are you going to do? Are you going to give the judgment to the landlord? No, I'm not going to do that. So what am I going to do? I join the case before another judge. You get, get, get it eventually. But uh, that's what was going on. And, who, were, who were the original housing judges that you appeared before? Do you remember? No, I don't remember the original ones. Because as, as it went on, my practice got bigger and bigger. And something else that happened. It used to be the system was the clerk had uh, a little rack in front of him, like sorting out the mail, like scrolling the calendar. And various, there were regulars in the court that were there every day. When they answered their calendars, they put their cases ready in their box. Their box. When you answered your last case, you had your calendar was answered, you'd tell the clerk, that's my last one, I have no motions or anything, and they'd take your case and send it to one part. So, the tenant's lawyers didn't like the fact that they had to wait for the, the landlord's lawyer, about four of us, and they had to wait for us till they wouldn't get their trial part until the last part was ready. So they started yelling, they want to go out right away. So they started seeing the public pressure, cases more ready, it went out. The next case more ready, it went out. And they started going to different parts. So I went up to the administrative judge and I said, this is impossible. I can't go out to different parts, the same point, or be defaulting in one place or another. And his answer was, I'm sorry, if you have too much work, get more help. Doesn't matter. That's where it's going to be. So, you know, what are you going to do? You're not going to fly back. That's why I had to get more help. That's why I wound up with a firm with 67 lawyers, 230 people working for me. I'm going to complain about the system. I don't so know. the housing part was good to you? Sure. <laughs> You know, this thing was designed to eliminate me from, they, they didn't want me there. They, this guy is bringing all these actions, terrible, we'll get rid of him. But what they did was they just made a system where I developed into a firm with 230 people working in the office. And that was, that was, uh, that's the net result. And, you know, I try to fight my cases all the time. A lot of people on my point, I try to settle all the time. Between the two of us, we were getting the cases out. But the point was, that we did the best we could, and I, I never was an ideologue. I didn't fight for landlords or tenants. I didn't care who walked into the office with his case first. That's the case I took. If I wasn't representing you a landlord and you came to me with a case, I took care of it. I have just as many cases I won for tenants as I won for landlords. It didn't matter to me, but uh, I, I don't know if I was the only one like that. Most of the lawyers down there represent only landlords or only tenants, and uh, went on. But anyway, it, it, I, I look and I thought it was very funny because I regard it as the uh, Chief of uh, Employment for Attorneys Act. Uh, keep lawyers busy and keep them working. There were all the cases in the city of New York used to be taken care of by about six lawyers. Now, now there are hundreds of lawyers down there every day. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what, what they've accomplished. They used to be able to get a case through in a month. Now it takes uh, four, five, six months to get a case through. The statute says that a tenant has five days to answer, and when he answers, the case should be put on by trial, not more than eight days or less than uh, it's five day, not less than five days or more than eight days thereafter. But they don't put it down for trial anymore. When housing case is put on account of a trial, the first time it's put into a part that's called a resolution part, which is not even. You can't get a trial and resolution part if you want to. If everybody says they want it, the judge wants to, you can't do it. It's a resolution part. They decide that over the course of time, they notice that more cases were settled than tried. So if it's going to be settled, why bother trying up a court with a trial calendar? We'll have a settlement part. So they have the, the, well, the resolution part. Uh, wait, I don't know. It goes on and on and on. It's more and more complicated, and I don't see any benefit to so it. So why did making housing judges? Why did creating a housing court with housing judges make it more complicated, do you think? Well, it didn't make it more complicated, it just dragged it out. Dragged it out. 
you had the, the housing court judges uh, didn't want to be seen as the people evicting people. I had a housing court judge say to me, Mr. Fenn, what do you think this is, a collection agency? Because I was bringing home payment cases. I said, yeah, that's what I think it is. That's what the legislature made it for. Where if I go to, to if I have a, a client that has a uh, meant to collect, I go to the statute, where am I supposed to bring the case? I bring it to this court. You're telling me this court's not the place for it? What do you want me to do? You know? But that's the way it went. On and on and on. And so housing court, when they created the housing court, that was the first time that one court could address the landlord's claim for rent and the tenant's claim for repairs at the same time? Is that no, right? No, 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 no. Because no. before you said they had to go to criminal court. They still have to do the same thing. It was code enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now they have the housing, in the Civil Court Act, the Housing Court Act provides a, uh, it's in the Civil Court Act, I think, for the housing part, has what they call the housing part now, mm -hmm. where a tenant may bring an action mm -hmm. uh, to compel a landlord to uh, take thing to, to repair, made repairs, but actually you only bring an action to compel a landlord to comply with a violation of law. But they, uh, they have worked out programs with the building department, and the tenant comes in, get a father's complaint, they order an inspection, and they inspected the, uh, and it works like small claims court. The clerk serves the papers for him, or the papers are served, but they order an inspection, and the inspector makes a report the same day the case is on. Corporation counsel has a, uh, an attorney in the housing part, and the city becomes an action, a, a point to every action there. And they're enforcing the code that way. So how do you think the HP part works? Well, the or HP part, the HP part works, I guess. But I don't see it's any, well, there's a lot of things that went on at the same time. They have the, uh, they, fed, they made the administrative code at first and then later the mobile building law to require the buildings to be, mobile buildings to be registered. The idea was, well, if you had to register and name an agent to uh, receive process, you also had a consent to receive the process by mail and the consent that the, the uh, agent was personally responsible for the fines and everything. So what happened was, when they did that, the building, the, uh, well, it went slowly, let me go back. First, when they were doing the criminal court investigations, the city had to prove the title, had to prove they had the landlord, and had to have personal service on them in the criminal court, otherwise you didn't have jurisdiction. So the registration was supposed to solve that. You had a party, you designated as a party to receive the summons by mail. You agreed that service by mail would confer jurisdiction on the court. You agreed that you were automatically liable for the person that was registered is liable for the fines and everything else. So they thought that would work. When they went to, to, uh, uh, to enforce that, they found they had the same problems of service and everything, even by mail. So what they did was they said, well, look, we're going to pass another law that requires uh, the registry of the landlord to prove the registration as part of his prime facie case. And we'll treat that as the same as a certificate of occupancy. If you have no certificate of occupancy in a residential, in a mobile dwelling, 302A says you can't collect the rent. So this statute said, if you're not registered, you're supposed to be registered, you can't use the courts. So what happened was that the building department, you'd imagine that someone in a, happened in an illegal apartment, let's say a two-family house, illegally uses a three. Well, technically, it's still a two-family house. Should the, legally, they say, well, it's a de facto multiple dwelling because you have three or more units in it. So if it, you sue somebody in that building, you get thrown out because you had to register. But if you went down and registered that building, the building department said, no, it won't really register. So the law was enacted to give them jurisdiction, and they developed the, the uh, procedures to reject that. So they can't get it, and they created a catch-22 on that score. And it, it, you see what I mean by complications? There are more and more complications, and every time somebody gets an idea, somebody gets a better idea. Better idea, you go nuts. Why did the building department refuse to take a registration from a de facto multiple dwelling? Well, they said, we don't trust the courts. If we give them a certificate of a registration number, 
the court will say, well, it's raised to multiplying, so it must be legal for him to get the rents. So we'll give him the rents, even though he doesn't have a certificate of occupancy. So they went, they, they get back and forth. Same way, when they amended the statute, originally, uh, petition, notice of petition could be served when it was conspicuous. You had to serve him on the person on a door and mail by ordinary mail. His ordinary mail is not enough. We'll have certified mail. The change of statute said you had to serve it by, by, by serving it by certified mail. When the post office, who used to just leave certified mail there, when, when, whether you were there to sign for it or not, found out that the people were getting jurisdiction in court for that, they stopped leaving the certified mail. They leave a notice that you have a certified mail. Come and get it. So when that happened, <laughs> they uh, went back and forth and said, well, now they're finding out it's worse. That the service is worse with certified mail was with regular mail. So change statute again to provide you have to serve both ways, regular mail and certified mail. So now some of the judges are holding when you certified mail, return receipt requested, that's no good because that's more restrictive than just what they reserved by mail. So, you know what I mean? You just can't win. But you can't win if you think you're going to make a law to, to provide free lunch. You just can't do it. So, uh, but as I say, it just makes it more and more complicated, more things to fight about. So you, you remember that you were talking about how you've got a resolution part and a trial part now. Mm. Remember before when you went to, the, to one housing judge and if you needed to have a trial, that judge would do the trial there. Well, was well, that better when, or worse when, when than, than first, the system? When I first did it, when I first did it, you had two parts now, so it's the calendar. You had the commercial part, right. which was called the housing part, and part 18. Uh -huh. And it renumbered all the numbers now. And it worked out with all different parts. Residential part was number 18. By the time you got the commercial parts, it was 52. Now there's no parts in between. But they still have the same numbers. But uh, we used so what to use the answer. What was part 18? They like? answered your calendar in part 18. And with Mark Ray, you said it sent out, the civil court judge sat part 18. Housing court judges didn't have jurisdiction over their calendars then. So we, we answered in 18, you'd be sent to a, so to a housing court. Theoretically, they, they parceled them out. But, when now is that when they were adjourned before this, case was adjourned always went back to the general calendar part. Now it was adjourned in the regular in the housing part, stayed in the housing part. So they started to pile up there. So you keep getting more and more cases and then resolve them. You get more and more cases backed up, now you got a big backlog there. So I don't know. It seems to me that they keep trying and trying and trying. The more they try, the more complicated they make it. The more they're just providing employment for attorneys, and uh, you know, there's just no, no way you can get free lunch. You know, as long as they have rent control, they have limited income, they have people that are going to try and make money somehow, and they stint on repairs, and you can't get free lunch. You can't get stuff for nothing. So, so is there any way in which things have gotten better over time? Well, better. I don't know what you call better. I don't know, but for a tenant, it's better. You tell me what. Well, what you for think. a tenant, it's better. If I have to represent a tenant, I might be able to keep him in there without paying the rent for five months or six months, where I could do not do more than ten days before. So for tenants, it's better. Landlords learn to live with it. That's all. But uh, you know, when the, for instance, all the rent statutes, a regular tenant can't put up more than one month security as rent. Where do you get? One month security comes from the fact that the landlord didn't need more than a month security. Because if you didn't pay the rent, he'd get you out, you get you be, go through its whole procedure legally, test his valid claim, have his claim enforced, and he'd be out within a month, he'd get the apartment re-rented, he wouldn't lose any more money. Today, it takes five or six months to get a tenant out. And I don't see how you can be real, 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 uh, I don't know, the rare exception where a case is served, tried, and, and, and even the issuance of the warrants where the paperwork involved now and nobody trusts anybody. In the old days when you had a default judgment, the clerk would check the papers, he found it was regular, he submitted to a judge, the judge would sign the judgment and be done with it. Now the judge the, the clerk knows it's gonna be scrutinized by the by a judge. He does everything with a microscope. He, very careful. 
they do a thorough job. They send up the chambers. Chambers is wait till the judge gets a chance. They'll do it again. And now, when 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 I was practicing originally, if I requisitioned the warrant on Monday at four o'clock, if I didn't have the warrant out by four thirty, and it came out nine thirty next morning, would come out with an apology from the clerk. I'm sorry it took so long. I had a problem, but it was. Today, you, even after trial, a judge says warrant forthwith or warrant state, you 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 be prompt and you can submit your application on a day you're supposed to. It'll take four to six weeks to get through the clerk's office and to the judge to get it signed anyway. So when a judge says warrant forthwith, it means you're going to be put out in six weeks. And even even the uh, Bureau of uh, the, the uh, I forget which name it is. The one that regulates marshals in the appellate division, you, they used to say three-day notice has to be a three-day notice. Now the statute provides for 72-hour notice you know, before you execute a warrant, and the big housing, the marshal's regulations interpret 72 hours as being six business days. So you can see it, that they don't uh, no, no urgency anymore in, in collecting monies. Are there, are, do, are there more cases now than there used to be, or was it always the same? No, I think there are probably more cases now than there were before. I don't, I don't know the statistics. Because I never bother with statistics. But you can check and see how many uh, indexed up they issue every year. I think my impression is that there are more. So but there are a lot more judges, a lot more housing court judges, although now there are fewer civil court judges. Right. Remember Judge Thompson's objection, and I think he had something like 15 or 16 judges in, in Manhattan, uh, maybe more. Now, you go to court, there's maybe three or four and, and, and judges working in civil court. They're all assigned now in the Supreme Court, criminal court, family court. The, the society has determined that there are other things more important than collecting the rent and taking care of civil fights. They don't care about them. So that's it. Do you notice any, over the course of your practice, you know, notice any changes in who the people were that became housing judges over time, or was it always pretty similar kinds of folks? No, I think it's pretty similar kind of folks, I think. Their uh, lawyers are interested in public service, and uh, my main career in the courts uh, used to be that uh, civil court judges, Supreme Court judges, were practicing lawyers and had maybe 20, 30 years experience had made all their money in their career. They capped their career with a few years on a bench. Today, there are people that determine when they're in law school they want to be judges. And they go from the beginning, they, they, they design a whole education to, to that end. And they get jobs that build resumes to that end. And they're building a resume that'll look good on their, uh, their, their election materials the first 10 years out of law school. So then they, they, and they run for judge right after that. So you get judges that, that they're well-intentioned, they know the law, they're doing the best they can, but they have no real experience. Uh, it's hard to, for a lawyer to get along in front of a judge who's never had to explain to his client why he, he lost the case. And collect a fee. You know, a judge, judge doesn't know that, doesn't, doesn't have that experience, treats the judges in front of him, the, the lawyers in front of him differently. Uh, so, so if you had the whole thing to do all over again, anything you would do differently? I didn't look. I just conducted my practice. I didn't have anything to do with the organization of the courts or the system. And I guess I reacted to the laws they, they made, the regulations they put into effect, and the procedures the court adopted. And fortunately for me, I was in the right place at the right time, and I was successful. I don't think I'm any smarter than anybody else. Or any, uh, not, you know, they tell me I'm a great lawyer and all that, but I don't see it. I just see I'm an ordinary guy who's in the right place at the right time, and it just took me by a seat and threw me up there. Well, you gave me this opportunity because the first time I didn't know what to expect, and it was more or less personal. Uh -huh. But um, the, the story of the court is very simple. Everybody thinks that they're doing a, you know, a big favor by giving them summary proceedings. Actually, it's the other way around. Before they had the civil court, the, the landlord and tenant court, there was no court at all. And the landlords would just take possession if they wanted it. And if they were wrong, they'd sue them later. So the idea was to put them under control so that people get a chance to test the 
the correctness of their position and we eliminate the abuses of uh, illegal evictions and everything. So in order to get them, there were no court at all, they said, well, we'll give you a fast track. It'll only be 10 days, you'll be a court. And so they got a speedy, uh, speedy proceedings involving the landlord and tenant court. In the beginning, there was a court where landlords went to recover possession of their property, either for non-payment, expiration of a tenancy, whatever it was. The landlord proved his case, he got what he wanted, and that was it. But somebody got the idea that you could legislate good housing. You don't have to pay for it, just pass a law and you get it. So <laughs> things began to get a little more complicated. The, um, now, in, in, in the beginning... When, when you're talking about where they started the proceedings for a landlord to come to court to get possession, you're right. not talking about housing court. Now we're getting to housing court. Okay. Now we get to the housing court. This is when they legislated it, that's housing court. No, now they made the present housing court. Okay. It evolved from the old real and tenant court, and right. the commercial part still operates the same way. The housing court now has all the functions. They decided that they're going to freeze rents and they're going to control rents. Of course, that gave other problems. When there was no rent control, and there was a free market, if the landlord didn't give you the services you want, you moved out, you went somewhere else. Now, we're freezing rents. So I told the landlords, don't worry. We're, we're going to freeze the rents in 1948. Anything you build after 1948 will be free of control. So they took their word for it. They built more housing. And uh, then came 1967. And they said, well, we promised you no rent control, and we meant it. We'll have a little bit of stabilization now. So, but anything after 1967 will be free, we promise you. So that went okay in 1974. 1974, they said, well, well we meant no rent, rent, no, no rent control. We kept our word, said no rent stabilization. We kept our word. Now we have a little rent stabilization, a little Tenant Protection Act. So what are you going to call the cancer next time? Yeah, you can build after 1974, you're free of everything anyway. So they made it so that the landlord gets a regulated income. But if he became, became uh, an entrepreneur and converted his buildings to co-ops or condos, then he had a lot of power. He could make millions of dollars. Buy an apartment for about $200,000, sell it for $3 million. That's the way it went. So they put a great incentive on the landlords to convert their properties to, to co-ops and condos, and they did. And a lot of the market went away and went turned over that way. So instead of relieving the housing shortage by controlling rents, they aggravated it, made it worse and worse. Now, this big this fiction of giving a tenant an apartment for low rent is just that, just, uh, just a fiction. Because in 1949, 80% of the city's budget was borne by the real estate tax. No more now, now it's about 18% or less. Why is that? Well, the rents are controlled. So the value of the property is controlled. So the taxes are controlled, you gotta have other taxes. So you got your cheap rent, but you also have to pay your city income tax, state income tax, eight and a quarter percent sales tax, all kinds of other business taxes that are put on, and passed on to the consumer under the table. You don't see it, but a man has to pay uh, unincorporated business tax, gonna get it back somewhere, so it goes into the price of his goods and services. So you wind up paying the same thing to live in New York City as if you pay a high rent. But politicians sold, it, sold the, company, the, the, the public the idea they got to have low rents, low rents, low rents. You got low rents. Of course, the living is the same, but low rents. Now, when you have rent control, then you had a problem. Now you can't move out anywhere. So now the landlords kind of skimp on maintenance in order to make money. So you have, you have a problem of... of uh, of in for code enforcement now. That evolved in this court also. So the more they control the prices, the more they have a problem with the controls, with them. they had to the, uh, enact the uh, warranty of habitability, which they didn't have, which created more and more work for the housing court. Areas that weren't in this court at all before are now in this court, so they're more and more. Now, they, it got so that statute design that says that if the tenant is served with a, with a notice of petition, he has five days to answer, and it'd be on for trial in eight days, no more than eight days, five to eight days. But it doesn't happen that way anymore. Because now when you come in, the time to answer, 
still five days. But in the old days, if you came to six days, the clerk turned you away, you were in default. Now they take the answer as long as they haven't removed the file to enter judgment against you in default, they take the, the answer late. And when you come in late, they, they decide that, well, most cases are settled on it and they come in, so why put it on a trial part? we put it in a, in a resolution part. So actually now when you come in, uh, when the statute says you come in uh, between five and eight days for trial, they mean you come between five and eight days for your first conference. You can't get a trial on the house because you stand on your head. Uh, you have to go to the administrative judge and make a big special project out of it. And maybe they would do you a favor, maybe. But they would let you know it's strictly a favor. The, uh, so we have more and more to go. Now, what, what did, what, this has social ramifications besides what I told you. In the old days, a couple had a, a large apartment with children. The children grew up. They moved to a small apartment. The children got an apartment, and they were in the neighborhood. Now the kids grow up, they can't get an apartment near their parents. Parents are not going to give up that cheap rent they have for anything. So you have two people living in a three-bedroom apartment, and they're frozen there. And if two kids come out, they get married, they want to raise a family, can't find an apartment in New York, have to go elsewhere. So in order to get cheap rent, not cheap cost of living, just cheap rent, you, people have given up their children, given up the family structure. But nobody sees this but me, apparently. I don't understand this. But anyway... <laughs> That's it. Now, more, most of the time now is spent in, in code enforcement. And the funny part of that is this. If a tenant starts an HP action, comes into the housing part, and they ask the landlord, why did you make the repairs? The landlord says, I didn't have the money. He says, that's no excuse. But in the 60s, there's a big, uh, big uh, for a rush of for pressure of code enforcement, especially in the tenements in the low rent areas. And they said, man, let's make a lot of money. We're going to press them for repairs. I said, the people are going to drop the hot buildings. Nobody believed me. Wound up with the people dropping their buildings. The city was the biggest owner of slums in the city, in the biggest slum lord there was. And when it came in, if they brought an HP action against the city, and the city's manager came into court, and the judge said, why did you make the repairs? He said, we didn't have the money. And the answer was, oh. Landlord said that. Private landlord said that. He said, no excuse. You either do it or we'll put you in jail, we'll find you and so on. But the city manager said, I haven't got the money. He said, I haven't got the money. Next case. It was just, it was, I was sitting there looking at it. To me, it was funny, but, but uh, nobody else appreciated the joke. <clears throat> but that's it. It's all because they're trying to get housing by passing a law, and there's no such thing. There's no such thing as free lunch. Housing's got to cost money. You won't give it to the landlords. You've got to get it somewhere. And they go on and on and on, more and more and more fighting. And now it got to the point where you, the statute says tenant can answer orally. But when you come orally before the judge, the, the clerk, it gives you a form to fill out. That's the oral answer. The form suggests the defenses to you. You look, it says the landlord didn't make repairs. A lot of times the, the tenant never even thought of that. The tenant didn't pay the rent because he lost his job, hasn't got the money, just can't pay. Whatever the excuse is, when he comes down to court, no, I'll say they didn't, didn't make the repairs. That's why I didn't pay him. I mean, the landlord refused to fix the ceiling, refused to fix the crack, refused to fix the fuse, some kind of stuff, and they fight. And you had conferences, you got trials eventually. Most cases get settled anyway, but there's this constant turmoil going on because they're trying to legislate housing so they don't have to pay for it. And you can't do that. Talking loud and fast, and I don't know how I'm coming across. Sounds, sounds good. Sounds good. Well, an nice historical perspective of what's been going on. In well, I, New York, in you your see, I, I'm, I'm impartial. This I represent men as I represent tenants. I regard myself as a mercenary. I represent the first one who walked into my office with the with the fee. I didn't care what side was on. You can look at my book, and I wrote, you'll see, that gives you both sides. I don't care. But I, I thought it was very interesting. But the, the reason that there's so much work is twofold. First, and mainly, is they, they evolve a lot more uh, a lot more duties on the housing court, a lot more areas to take care of than they had before. And secondly, is the pressure of uh, the uh, economy and everything is such that uh, that's it. 
I remember once I was in the building of the commissioner's office, and he was lecturing me on these terrible landlords and, and the, how, they, how these violations do exist. I said, what are you talking about? Most people don't even think about it until they have to go to court, and then, then they, they think of all repairs. He said, why? What well, makes you say that? I said, well, I'm sitting in a chair with you talking here. Right from here, you want me to show you housing violations in your office? Yeah, he said, nothing wrong with my office. I said, oh yeah? Well, look at that open and defective electric circuit. I said, there was a, a little uh, plate was off one of his floor sockets. Uh, broken defective ceiling plaster. Uh, broken and defective uh, uh, wiring. I showed him all, all around, I started to point out one violation after another, right in the middle of where he was sitting, he never even saw it. And that's what it is, people don't complain until they have to. I once had a case where I went up to the tenant and said, why didn't you pay the rent? And she said, I did pay it. I said, you did, you have proof? She said, yes, here's the receipt. So I said, let me see it. Gave me a receipt, it was my client's receipt. June 1, 1968, paid, received from her tenant, the rent, the monthly rent for the month of June, June 1 to June 31st, signed by the landlord. I said, it's amazing. Went back to my clan on the other stroke matter. He said, it can't be. This is the system I use. He showed me, he was a small landlord. He bought books in the, in the five and 10 receipt books. And he filled out the receipts for all the apartments in a row. And he had the receipt and then the carbon and then the, the copy, the receipt and the carbon and the copy. And when he got to this apartment, here was the receipt was still in his book. So I looked and I noticed he filled in the dates he never filled in the years. And her receipt had the year in it. She was obviously using last year's receipt. She just filled in the year and she had it. So I was sitting there. I go, I, I give her back the receipt and we walked back in the courtroom. I held it up to the light. Hmm. I went over the window, I held it up to the light and there's still light. Hmm. I went back to her and I said, good, we go inside. Then the judge may ask you why you didn't pay the rent. Show me you're sitting town. And I, and I turned to my client. And so she could hear, I said, I hope she was a, was convicted of grand larceny. She'll go to jail for two years. You'll get the apartment back, you'll make a lot of money. <laughs> and that's all. Well, we're listening to cases. The first case, the tenant said, well, let's say, the tenant, why didn't you pay the rent? She said, my toilet was stuffed up and the landlord wouldn't fix it. So the landlord said, then tell me, I'll fix it right away. During two weeks, go fix the toilet. The next one said, why didn't you pay the rent? She said, well, my kitchen ceiling is pe 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 peeling, the glass is falling into my cooking when I'm cooking on a stove. I can't do it, the landlord won't fix it. Okay, made an appointment, two weeks, we'll, we'll go do that. Third, we had some other third complaint. Now you get to my client. This case, she said, well, "Why did you pay the rent?" She said, "My toilet stopped up. My kids, she, she repeated the three repairs, the three cases before all of it. Her case never used the receipt at all." Very funny. See, well, that's what happens. Another time, I had a very beautiful, intelligent woman, and she started. We went outside to discuss the case. She started giving me some kind of cock and bull story. So I said, to her, "Look, you can go inside and tell that to the judge." He may believe you. You win. But please, don't insult my intelligence out here with that cock and bull story. Uh, whatever your reason is for not paying rent, it's okay. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. And that's it. Well, we went and we took care of the case. Three weeks later, she shows up in my office. I said, what's the matter? She said, I want to retain you. Why? So I have a real case. I need a good lawyer. I'm the only lawyer I met. I have any brains down there. So, <laughs> Another time I had a, 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 a landlord with a tenant in his apartment. His, his defense was that the building was a converted loft building and the landlord didn't have it registered yet. So I said, look, everything's been completed. We got the CO. Registration will be in effect in two weeks. Settle with me. I'll give you three weeks to pay the rent. And if not, then okay, I'll meet you next time when we come to court. In two weeks, I'll have you back here. But don't ask me for any favors that time you go to court and try the case. So that's exactly what happened. He said, no, I don't care. So I came back two weeks later. Luckily, I had the same judge on the bench. He asked me for an adjournment the first time. So I said, no, I'm ready for trial. He went to the judge and asked for adjournment. And the judge said to him, I remember you from two weeks ago. You should have dealt with Mr. Finkelstein then. You don't want to make a deal then? I'm ready for trial. Sit down. 
and got final judgment five days, next case. Two weeks later, the guy's in my office. What's the matter? He says, I have property in Brooklyn. I want to retain you. I want you to do for me what you just did to me. Uh, well, that's just, just paying attention to, to the law and, and the facts and what is in each case. And that's all. But uh, there's a lot of work going on because people expect to get good housing by passing a law, and it just won't help. Well, I want one tragic case I got to tell you about. A woman was not paying the rent because she had real serious problems with her future warrant of habitability. She came and was acting pro se. In the conference, the court attorneys or whatever, they thought they were doing her favor. They dismissed the landlord's case on some technicality. Came back the next time, same thing. She wanted to get to the point of getting her things repaired, but they kept dismissing the case on the technicalities, and she was waiting, don't complain, get out of here, get out of here. Meantime, finally the landlord's lawyer got disgusted. He said, the hell with this housing court, and the hell with this uh, summary proceedings. I'm going to sue him in the check room for not payment of rent in the Supreme Court and see what happens. So he started there. He had discovery, dragged her down discovery, and went through the whole procedure. And she had death in the family, had to go to Florida. So she goes to Florida, take care of her funeral, tells the neighbor, please watch my mail. If anything comes from the court, call me up, let me know, I'll come back and take care of it. Well, nothing came from the court because it came from the other lawyer's office. He called down for, for uh, a discovery, didn't come, made a motion to strike her answer for failure to comply with discovery, got the, got the, finally got the judgment, got a warrant, got the order of ejectment, and she gets a call from the client, from the neighbor, says the marshal's coming to put your stuff on the street tomorrow. So she got evicted, came back, tried to open the case. Nobody would listen to her, because the Supreme Court judge got the idea she was just a troublemaking tenant or just putting off everything forever, litigating forever, had no sympathy for her, and she never got her apartment back. Terrible. So, you know, it's so not. You've seen a lot of changes in the court over the years. Oh, yeah. And do you think there are changes for the better or for worse? Or? It's just different. It's different. Does it work better? Do you think cases get processed more efficiently? Well, it's not the case. The cases are being processed, by the way. That's not the problem. The judges are, are very well meaning. They do the best they can. Staff is dedicated. They work. It's, it's, it's just to give them so much to do. And they got the impossible to accomplish. You can't accomplish it. You can't legislate or adjudicate a good housing or repair or anything. It takes money. It takes, you know, and what they've done with this whole system is now, when, and when I started out, a, a co-op was a rarity and a condo didn't exist. Now, all the decent housing is co-ops and condos. Rental is high rent or nothing. The, 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 registered, the regulated rents are shrinking and shrinking all the time because there's no money in it for the landlords. I don't say no money in it, but it's a limited regulated amount of money when if they go the other way, if they build for a condo, they build today, they build for tax tax benefits uh, or, or else they build for co-ops or condos. They don't build to, to manage, to, to have a tenement to be rented for people living and make a profit from it and continue in business. You're really speaking more to, I would think, New York County. Well, yeah, you're right. Because clearly there's a lot more rental housing in the Bronx and Brooklyn. Well, but not cheap. It's not, they're not building regulated houses. They're, they're not saying you build them with so Section 8. Existing housing, which is... Well, the building I lived in when I got married was torn down. I don't know why. I, I haven't been up to the... I don't go touring around the city. I don't know what's mm -hmm. there. But the regulated housing as a whole is shrinking in the whole state. So I imagine it's shrinking in the Bronx also. If someone moves out, the landlord does his damnedest to get the rent up over two thousand dollars so he can have a deregulated apartment. You know, this fiction of uh, that's, well, I don't know that that's happening in the Bronx well, because you just, the rents aren't going to hit well, over two thousand. Well, the income's not going to be there. You're dealing, you know, there's a huge condo well, population true. there. Well, where the landlords are depending on anybody but a tenant to be paying the rent, whether it's Section Eight or public assistance. Yeah, my, my, yeah, well, uh, I remember I had. Roosevelt Gardens was one of my clients in a very big apartment development on uh, uh, Grand Concourse uh, in the 70s or 80s, 170, 180 or something like that. And I told him the landlord needs to have a big problem because what happened was the uh, mostly welfare tenants 
he had to have guard dogs go around with him to collect the rent. And when the tenant moved in, they got a rent allowance for furniture and everything else. And then three months later, they pay one, one month's rent, and they would start withholding rent. They wouldn't evict him the first month, the second month, the third month, and then about the fifth month, he'd have to start eviction proceedings, and the tenant would have a fire. What was a fire? Why? Because when they were burned out, well, they gave him another $2,000 of furniture and started another, started thing in another apartment, same thing. So he said, they have a fire, they get $2,000 of furniture, they buy furniture $1,500 for $500 in their pocket, and uh, start the same cycle, five months and there's another fire, five months and another. But how do you deal with the cycle of so many people living in a poverty, poverty population? They need to have some sort of housing for them. And by not having some sort of regulated housing, how do you address? Oh, you're going, you're going, you're going to have, you're going to have, it. now you have no choice. They have to continue the thing. The system is there, it's got to go in until it dies out normally over the long range, long time. But, you know, you got to realize where it came from and what you got. You're not, and then the work, you just have to go on. Uh, housing for judges, housing for personnel, you're going to have to wrestle with it more and more. There was no warranty of habitability until 1974, 75, because you didn't need it, but now you need it. And you need the code enforcement, you need all that stuff. And that's what makes the the, uh, uh, the housing court work heavier and heavier. Mm -hmm. You look at it, you have very few, uh, you don't have as many holdovers as you used to have. You have mostly non-payments in, in there. Yeah. Uh, I got a, a case for once where I don't know what's going to happen. But for instance, now, I'm just acting as a consultant to somebody. It's in Manhattan. Tenant, landlord doesn't want to evict the tenant. Tenant collects garbage. To you, it's garbage. To me, it's garbage. Anybody's garbage. To her, it's treasure. It's good property. And somebody throws out a pillow because they have bed bugs. It's a good pillow. She takes it into her apartment. So she had bed bugs that started to spread through the whole building. The landlord took an, a, 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 a bullet hole over for seeing a nuisance. They got, got a guardian of item. The guardian of item had an article 81 guardian appointed. They came in, they cleaned up the apartment. Miller got a final judgment for a stay pending appointment of a guardian in light of uh, a Article 81 guardian. When the Article 81 guardian was appointed, they cleaned up the apartment. So the landlord didn't execute the warrant. Didn't even ask for it. Let him go. Now it's years later. Now the guardian goes in there, cleans out the apartment. The next day, she's out there. Same day after the guy. They drag everything through the halls. They drag all that stuff through the halls and spread the bed bugs through the whole building. And then they leave. She goes out to the sidewalk, picks up the garbage, and takes it back to her apartment. So they did that three times. Man, let's say, well, I got to start another action. So you go to the Supreme Court, get permission to start another action from the guardian. The judge appointed the guardian. And we're coming back. What, so what is the guardian in light of the guardian? Uh, Article 81 guardian do. The woman actually needs supervision. She needs to be put into a home where I'll watch her because she's going to keep doing this. His action is seeing as to resist the landlord. And he brings an HP action, not to make him repairs. Um, I think I'm going to watch what's going to happen in that case. It's, uh, you know, I would say the guardian should do something to help the woman out. Instead, he's just going to put the problem off on the landlord. Mm -hmm. So the landlord, if the landlord's not permitted to evict this person, the next thing you know, the other tenants will be complaining. They're complaining now, but they'll be taking him to court, to the housing part, to get rid of the bed bugs. And you can't get rid of the bed bugs because of this woman. The court won't let put this woman out. What are you going to do? You know, it's a real problem, but, you know, you know, look at the problem. Instead of looking at this, just landlord against tenant fighting, landlord and tenant fighting. They actually, the landlords and tenants have to live together. But they don't, they can fight with each other. So it was, it, it, was a, it was funny at the beginning because it made me a, a wealthy lawyer. I made my whole career that way. But I recognized it the, all the time. My staff, when my staff came back from court yelling about what the judge did to them, what the other lawyer did to them, I used to tell them, why are you angry? If it wasn't for that, you wouldn't have a job. You wouldn't be there. You know, the old days they'd come in and say to the tenant, why didn't you pay the rent? Well, the landlord didn't fix it. Well, sorry, that's no excuse. Go to the rent commission, get a rent reduction. 
and the rent commission would act within 10 days or a month or so if it was really true the landlord wasn't making repairs, they would cut his rent. But in the court, it was just pay the rent or get out. And that was it. But, but now the court's doing everything. Now the court's doing everything. The rent commission doesn't, there's no rent commission really, HPD and the, uh, the uh, HCR, the, 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 the start a case there, they, two years to get resolved. Nothing. No. The courts got the obligation. The idea was to have the court handle court enforcement and uh, collection of rents. But it's gotten to the point where really the staff doesn't really understand the primary purpose of the court was to collect the rents. Now it's the primary purpose of the court is to see if there's decent housing. And see repairs are made and everything else. And some of the judges resent the fact that you think they're a collection agency. But where else is the landlord going to go to get his rent? 